Hello and welcome to Solutions. This is the seventh episode of our third series of podcasts for solution-focused hypnotherapists and I'm Cathy Eland. And I'm Trevor Edwards and we're both experienced solution-focused hypnotherapists. Today we're looking at genetics and how it can affect our mental health. Yeah, I think it's important to recognise that genetics is just one thing that can affect a person's mental health. Their childhood, environment and much else can also have a huge effect. Okay, so let's start with the basics. Firstly, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And this carries the genetic instruction for the development, functioning, growth and reproduction of an organism. A human's genome is the specific 23 pairs of chromosomes they have in their DNA. The genome is written using four nucleotides, which are called adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Secondly, each gene is composed of three nucleotides combined in a specific order. And thirdly, DNA codes for proteins, which are produced and they become cells, tissues, organs and chemical messengers that regulate the body. Okay, so if you think of DNA as the hardware, then your epigenome is the software. So the cells in your eye turn off all the other genes except eye-related ones. And it's the same with liver cells, etc., etc. Uh, diseases such as heart disease, cancer, diabetes and dementia are a consequence of a change to the epigenome. So how is the epigenome changed? It's down to a process called DNA methylation, where methyl groups are added to the DNA molecule. Okay. So in fact, methyl groups, which are CH3, wrap around DNA. These tell your body whether to activate a gene or not. DNA methylation is influenced by your habits and environment. The addition of methyl groups turns off a gene and the removal of the methyl groups activates the gene. Various enzymes regulate methylation and require coenzymes to work. Yeah, so DNA methylation is influenced by diet, exercise, stress, relationships, Thoughts, nutritional status, toxins, sleep, infections, etc., etc. And your life can positively or negatively affect your epigenome. Uh, Great. Okay. The exposome is the technical term given to everything that has happened to you over your life. Wow. And it seems that 96% of a person's eye colour is controlled by genes. 80% of their height and 70% of their weight are also controlled by genes. Schizophrenia is 50% controlled by genes, the same as uh, general intelligence. Wow. And so you might think that all mental health conditions listed in the DSM-5 have a gene or genes that cause them. That seems logical, doesn't it? I've got a feeling you're going to tell me that that's not the case, aren't you? I might do. Let's look at Robert Plowman in his book, Blueprint, How DNA Makes Us Who We Are. He argues that psychological conditions shouldn't be treated as either something a person has or they don't have. He suggests that this model leads to psychiatrists then looking for a cause for the condition. Plomin argues that unlike eye colour, there are no single genes for psychological conditions. Instead, there is a bell-shaped curve and people with psychological conditions are at one end of the curve. Plomin asserts that there are a large number of DNA differences that are related to a psychiatric disorder. The more of those differences that a person has, the more likely they are to experience a psychological problem. The issue, he concludes, is quantitative, not qualitative. So, if there isn't one specific gene responsible for each psychological disorder, what is there? 
Well, it seems there are generalist genes whose effects are spread across a number of conditions. Plomine cites examples where a parent has a diagnosis of depression, but the child has a diagnosis of antisocial behaviour. Surprisingly, not the same condition, which you would expect if there were to be one single gene for that condition. Plomin informs us that developmental studies have found that one condition often changes into another. And twin studies have found that generalised anxiety disorder and major depressive disorders are the same thing genetically. Mm, that is interesting. Um, in contrast to the dozens of disorders in DSM-5, Plomin's research has found three broad genetic clusters. They are internalising problems, things like anxiety and depression, externalizing problems like antisocial behavior and alcohol dependency and psychotic experiences like hallucinations and includes schizophrenia bipolar disorder and major depression right okay and so for the people who like to understand the tech terms used in genetics pleiotrophy is the name given to one gene that influences two or more seemingly unrelated phenotypic traits. A phenotype is an individual's observable traits. For example, your height or the colour of your eyes or the blood type. Polygenicity is where one particular trait is influenced by more than one gene. Traits that display a continuous distribution, such as height or skin colour, are polygenic. Now, a polygenic score is a correlation coefficient. A genome-wide association study, the GWAS, identifies single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, in the DNA that correlate with the trait of interest. The SNPs are markers only, although they might, in some cases, suggest genomic neighbourhoods in which to search for genes that directly affect the trait. The polygenic score itself is no sense causal. Wow, lots of information there. So, um, <laughs> yeah, a genome-wide association, that's the GWA study, is an observational study of a genome-wide set of genetic variants in different individuals to see whether any variant is associated with the trait. So, the GWA study identifies single nucleotide polymorphisms, the SNPs, in the DNA that correlate with the trait of interest. The SNPs are markers only. This has revealed tens of thousands of genes that can have an effect, and the average effect size is 0.01%, so very, very small. All these differences create that bell-shaped distribution that we were talking about earlier, and only people with an unfortunate combination will be at one or other end of that distribution. By taking account of all the SMPs a person has relating to a particular trait, it's possible to derive a polygenic score indicating the likelihood that they will become depressed, anxious, schizophrenic, obese, or much else. Goodness. Um, and with this genetic information, it now becomes possible to diagnose conditions based on the cause rather than on the symptoms, or usually a person's behaviour, as is done now. People can be depressed for all sorts of reasons, but polygenetic scores can predict the extent to which a person will be depressed for genetic reasons. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, this creates a revolution in psychiatric treatment and in categorising and diagnosing conditions. It also gives a way to look at what's different about people at the end of the curve furthest from the psychological condition. Are they exceptional as well? Or do they have their own issues associated with the genes that they have? And all these differences can be found in the 1% of our DNA that can be different from one person to another. 
the other 99% we all share. And with these latest advances in the DNA detection, it now becomes possible to predict not exactly what will happen in a person's life, but the likelihood of something or the degree to which that something will happen. Yeah, in May 2021, uh, GWAS of Genetic and Health Records of 1.2 million people from four separate data banks identified 178 gene variants linked to major depression. This study was led by the US Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, VA researchers at Yale University School of Medicine and University of California, San Diego, and was published in May 2021 in the journal Nature Neuroscience. Right. And depression is genetically complex and is characterized by combinations of many different genetic variants. The size of this GWAS study will help clinicians to develop polygenic risk scores to pinpoint who's most at risk of developing major depression and other related psychiatric disorders such as anxiety or post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. And I think this information from the world of genetics gives us a different way to look at mental health issues and perhaps helps to break the shackles that much research has to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which has grown since version three by looking at the way people behave rather than any underlying cause or structure to mental health. DSM has also been criticised for having been put together by middle-aged men sitting down in a room together and arguing over symptoms rather than being science-led. So this has been very interesting, if not enlightening, and I hope it has given everyone some food for thought. Yes. Well, next time we'll be looking at the mind-body link, how what happens in the mind affects the body and vice versa. Well, I can't wait. So until then, it's goodbye from me, Cathy Eland. And it's goodbye from me, Trevor Eddles. So we will see you next time. Yeah. Bye. Bye.